Hi everyone, thanks for joining us tonight for the first session of Assembly 2020, a special online edition of Somerset House Studios annual experimental music series running September the 23rd to the 27th. I'm Tamar Clark Brown, I'm a writer, artist and curator interested in emerging and experimental futures, diasporic practices and intimate choreographies. Today I'll be speaking to artist Sadie Char ahead of the presentation of her new audio work Moon Poetics for Courageous Earth Critters and Dangerous Daydreamers Assembly 2020, which is a result of a four-month studio residency at Somerset House Studios. Through her performance, painting and performance video, painting and textiles, Zadie explores the overlapping and conflation of cultures that inform self-identities and notions of self. Throughout her practice, Zadie uses water and marine ecologies as metaphors for exploring the unknown, whilst also alluding to abstract notions of homeland. Recent solo exhibitions include Child of Magahalmi and the Echoes of Creation, a co-commission with Art Night London, Yarrick Contemporary Art Space Baku, Tramway Glasgow, and Dear War Pavilion Bexhill. She has also staged performances at international galleries and festivals, including Art Night London 2019, 58th Venice Biennale, Palais de Tokyo, Hayward Gallery, Serpentine Gallery, Block Universe, and the Korean Cultural Center, UK. Zadie's new piece will be presented online this evening at 7 p.m. following this chat, available on a new interactive listening platform made especially for the series. That's at assembly2020.co, so do check it out afterwards. On, the, on this almost eve of the September equinox, we're gonna be discussing the work, the ideas it engages with, and the process of making. Um, while inviting into the conversation a text that has been key for, quite key, I understand, for Zadie over this time, Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown, published 2017 by AK Press. Emergent Strategy represents this idea of being in right relation with each other, other species on the planet, and welcoming this complexity and collaboration in the face of critical change and movements towards justice. The book is dedicated to people that want to change the world in the right way. As, and as many monuments are toppling, and there are so many kind of different narratives around identity happening and evolving, it's a really crucial time to be to, to have this conversation with Zadie and see what new ideas she has to put into the space. So, it's not just a case of the new normal. We know that the world needs to change if we're to survive, or rather that we need to change if we're to survive, and we need to rework our reality and socialise each other better, because the world isn't ours alone. Enough from me. Zadie and me will talk for about 30 minutes um, and then we'll open up to questions. So and so, please put any of your um, questions you've got in the comment section on the social streams that you're watching and we'll go from there. So let's start. Let's get into the conversation. Zadie, let's start at the beginning. Could you introduce the work for us in your own words? Sure. I guess beforehand, it's raining very, very hard right now in London. Can you, can you hear me okay? It's like I got like a tin, a tin roof above me and it's just like pounding. You can hear me though. Okay, um, so basically, <laughs> I was sorry. wondering what it was. I was wondering what it's, it was. It's very intense. Okay, so basically, I am presenting a six-part narrative, whereby uh, the viewer or the, the audio viewer will be taken on kind of a journey through, let's think, five parallel dimensions, um, guided by five different creatures or animals that kind of explain, I guess, their lived situation or. Um, problems that they're encountering at the cause or the hands of humans. Um, and so as the lister, I'm hoping that um, everyone thinks deeply about what, they, what they're talking about and how that, some of those things are, are paralleled and mirrored in the kind of uh, difficulties that I think a lot of people are thinking about and facing uh, today. Were there kind of specific feels or thoughts behind the creation of the work? Why now, yeah. for example? Yeah, so you know, I was um, I uh, I came on board to do this project, this residency, kind of I think around June or I don't really remember, but I had been thinking about this project since um, December last year, and um, I was originally going to make this work for an exhibition that I have coming up in Canada at Remy Modern Museum and Leeds uh, next year, um, and I knew I wanted to make a sound piece that would be the anchor point to the rest of the exhibition. Um, but, you know, obviously, uh, COVID happened, um, and then the subsequent uh, media frenzy and, you know, centered focus on uh, institutionalized racism and police brutality and murder against Black folks, and particularly in the United States. And so with all of this time and chaos 
that was going around me, I had a lot of time to really think about the way in which I was shaping this story. And, you know, since the beginning, I think I was largely thinking about a continuation of my interest in creation myths and kind of um, femme or female archetypes, especially within mythology and um, fantastical ideation or writing. And also interests in um, marine ecologies and how I often use that as a backdrop to think about kind of traversing throughout the diaspora for an ancestral homeland that might be abstract and actually not even in existence as you know we know within this time. But I suppose once I started really thinking deeply about the ecology and thinking about um, the city that uh, my family immigrated to and I was born in on the Pacific Northwest coast, I started thinking kind of more readily about day-to-day -day things that are happening there, happening to folks that are on the ground there. Um, Sorry, uh, and, and thinking about how, how, I, how those things actually related to some of the things that I was thinking through, oftentimes through maybe like a more um, fantastical narrative, you know, again, thinking about parallel worlds, but how am I able to bring those parallel worlds and how are they able to touch on key issues today? And obviously in the beginning when COVID was, heavy, was such, such the, the, the focus of what people were paying attention to, you know, there's a lot of articles talking about how, um, we humans are, are not in right relation with the land basically, right? And how you destroy nature, you basically unleash a lot of different things that, you know, um, in succession cause other problems. Everything is connected. So, I mean, that was something I was largely thinking about and I felt really, really important. It felt very important to address those things within the work and not in a way like I wasn't trying to make, you know, coronavirus artwork or anything, which is fine, if, however people want to respond. But it just became very apparent that, of course, these ideas are urgent. You know, being from the Pacific Northwest Coast, I think the idea of environmentalism, reduce, re reuse and recycle, you know, I'm turning 37 this year. These things were taught to me when I was in kindergarten when I was about five years old. So these are things that I, you know, I've been thinking about for a long time. But it's it's just it's just impossible to not really really pay attention. You know, this is kind of the first time that I've really been thinking about ecology in my work in such a profound way, and it's probably because these things, as we know, are it's the touchstone of what is part and parcel of so many societal social problems that we are facing. So I know this is, that was a very long-winded way in which to kind of describe those things, but I mean, I, it it is essentially what a, what. I was thinking about and why now, as you just said, and you know that can extend into other other things that we're thinking about and being in right relation to each other as well. How are we treating one another, you know, and how are these things interconnected with land, with people, with history? Absolutely. Was that? Do you feel like there was kind of an intention you set when you set about making it? Was there a something that you wanted to? To achieve was there a particular intention, or was it kind of more of an ex exploration of these of this moment in time, and how we can you, be in right relation, as you say? You know, I think I think previously in my work, I'm always thinking about. I guess the intention of the work is, you know, to explore certain, I guess, like you know, shadowed stories or things that haven't had much attention to in the past, just because of, um, you know, patriarchal viewpoints colonialism, et cetera. But I think more than ever now, I guess I was thinking about rather than exploring certain ideas that kind of were self-serving to what my own interests were and what I wanted to just explore because of my own kind of, you know, fanciful thoughts of, you know, self-expression or something. I guess when you have so much time to sit at home and really think deeply about what's going on, um, I think it, for me anyways, it hit a nerve where I thought, what am I doing? What, what is the point of, you know, the work that I'm making? How is it benefiting anyone? It's, I think especially for someone who shows largely in public institutions, which are places that should serve the public, right? Like what kind of service can my work do, my own small voice? And so there are certain things in the sound work that, you know, are also part of the exhibition that it'll be a part of later this year. I was thinking about very specific moments let's just say that are happening in Canada, for example, with like, you know, the pipelines, you know, indigenous folks asking, demanding for their own 
um, sovereignty to self-govern and to be, you know, have full uh, stewardship over the land. You know, as someone who's living in the UK and is really disconnected to what's going on on the ground there, I'm only able to kind of hear about that stuff secondhand on the internet or on Instagram or something. And so for me, I just feel like it's really important to have these conversations and discussions within work, if that is the way your work works. This is not to say that every artist needs to do that. They might, you know, hold that space in their life in a different way um, throughout, you know, activities they might embody within their community. But for me, it just felt really important. Like, what can my work do? What can I touch to? How can this be of service to other people? And that sounds sounds really self-aggrandizing. And I, I don't mean for it to. I mean, like, the way I'm speaking about the work in the work is I am thinking largely about the conversations I've had with my own colleagues and people that are in my community. And I feel like the more we talk about things, the more these things become normalized and mainstream and hopefully encourage people to make small gestures within their own community in order to make impact. I think it's really easy to feel a lot of weight on one shoulder and ponder about how you can be a better person and do less bad. And then it becomes really, I feel like nihilistic to think about all the things that we're up against. So I felt like in my own way, this was something that I could insert because I had a very small platform that would hopefully generate conversation and really think thoroughly about the engineering of a project or a presentation and how that involves so many people and so many hands, right? So this goes back to a dream Marie Brown's emergent strategy and, 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 you know, the experience of working within activists and community circles, which I don't belong to, but I'm definitely here to listen and to learn and think about how I can apply those things in my own personal life as well. Thank you for giving us that really, um, that really full answer in, in terms of that question. I think it really sets up so much of the way that you're thinking and moving through and the production of the thought process around the work. Um, I think it's a good time to swing into the specifics of it. Um, and I understand that the work is kind of loosely based on this uh, this this story of someone called Princess Barry. Could you tell us a little bit about, about her and about why you kind of chose to take that as a route into the work? Yeah, so I think a lot of, in the recent, I guess recent five years, the way I've kind of always started a project was thinking about um, Korean mythology and folk tales. This princess body or body gongchu um, uh, is, was a seventh daughter of a king and queen. And basically uh, this is a kind of a, Korean mythological folk tale that was uh, passed orally through Korean shamans. And in, in Princess Bari's plight, she basically went through hell in order to um, reach life, a life-saving elixir uh, in order to save her parents, the king and queen who basically abandoned her, that's what her name means, um, in order to save their lives. So what uh, I thought was really interesting about this is, as I was saying earlier, sorry, we cut out uh, my, I got a little bit of a brain freeze, is that oftentimes with my work, I think about um, Korean mythology and folk tales. I think largely because I'm really interested in storytelling. And as a young child, this is the way, this is kind of the entry point into Korean culture that I was able to access through um, my mom telling me stories at night. So anyways, this is kind of how I usually think about uh, the ideas in which I'm working um, I will uh, find a story that I, I feel like has resonance with some of the things I want to say and then use it as kind of a very loose framework how I might navigate a story. I never make original work. I'm very unoriginal. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, the reason why I thought Princess Bari was interesting was I'm because of my interest in Korean shamanism with the idea of kind of traversing um, the living and the dead world, Princess Bari is uh, thought to be the kind of... Uh, the deity or the goddess who is able to bring um, souls to the underworld. So the connector to uh, the living and the dead. Um, and the way she got there was basically, she went through all these trials and tribulations, went through hell and back. And she basically went on this journey in order to find this cure for her parents. And um, this story, obviously, depending on geographically where it's told has variances, but uh, one, of the, one of the versions is, is that she went and she had to find uh, these special flowers and an elixir of life water to uh, bring to her parents in order to revive them back to life. Um, how that relates to my story is I was really interested in kind of centering the audience as a princess buddy and uh, taking everyone on a guided journey in order to find this kind of, you know, 
life-saving water thing that would help uh, heal an ailing world, basically. And I was interested in the idea of time travel and how um, the audience was able to do that through the kind of guided um, uh, guided instructions of these of these creatures, these these five characters. Sorry, tomorrow you are back. Okay. <laughs> back. Sorry, it's a, okay. bit a, ghost, it's a bit of a ghost okay. talk. I think the rain's okay. playing with us a little bit today. Okay, cool. Um, sorry, I, I, I was kind of rambling there. I felt a bit um, insane because I was just talking to myself. Like, talking but anyways, about <laughs> I was, I was. So I was just, I gave, gave a very, very strange, discombobulated overview of why I was interested in the story um, and how it relates to the framework of the way I was thinking about putting the audience at the center point as if they themselves are princess body, the ones who have to journey uh, and be guided through you know different dimensions, meeting all sorts of characters in order to hopefully find some type of solution for whatever this thing is that's going on that's uh, yeah basically um, not good for anyone living on this planet. So, and we meet these um, so these five characters: the conch, the seagull, the cabbage, the fox, and the orca. Mm -hmm. um, some of which are kind of characters from past works, right? Why did you choose these kind of particular voices? So yeah, I think as I was saying earlier, I, I just just the same way I use kind of like Korean mythology or ideas of storytelling as a framework in order to start a work. I usually latch on to certain um, objects or animals or things because I obviously inherently uh, probably narcissistically see myself in them or find some type of attachment. So for me, you know, the cabbage idea is I'm... Um, uh, like most Koreans, um, I really love kimchi, which is like a fermented cabbage side dish that's a kind of a national food staple of Koreans. And it's thought to be very good for your digestive gut. So just thinking about, you know, a power food that I very much connected to when I was a child, I watched my mom make it. It's like my favorite food. You know, my partner makes it for me. It's something I really adore, but also thinking about its relationship to the land and thinking about how it, um, how, you know, its relation to flora and fauna basically, and how that can be a stand-in for thinking about the earth, what's inside. Um, the seagull, you know, being from the Pacific Northwest coast, even living in London, having my studio here, I've got a colony of gulls outside. I think seagulls have always made me really feel at home listening to them, like, you know, whatever, very shrilly scream out. I, I like it, I find it comforting. And I've always thought of the seagull as being quite a scrappy, opportunistic kind of like, um, working class bird and I guess it's kind of how I've always imagined myself if I was a bird I'd probably be a seagull um, and then again the fox I'm really interested in shape-shifting for those who are interested in um, uh, East Asian folklore people will know there's a lot of different shape-shifting animals the fox is one of them and so I was interested in using an animal that um, you know, had that kind of rootedness within mythology, but also its relationship to folklore in the UK and also the presence it has here in London or in other, you know, cities like Leeds where I will have the exhibition next year. I, I'm interested in kind of bridging in, bridging in that type of connection for the audience. So, you know, folks in, in Saskatoon in Canada or in, in Leeds, they can also relate, you know, they might not relate to the orca as much because it's not an animal that they associate with their city, but foxes I feel are ubiquitous everywhere and quite interesting malign characters in history. And I find um, really um, quite charismatic. And then the orca, as you know, you know, I'm not sure everyone else does, but it's just an animal, it's my favorite animal and it's an animal that I have been thinking about since I was a very small child. And um, very recently with some of the um, previous projects that I have worked with, they've been kind of the, the protagonist, the star. Um, so I wanted to, I guess, make the connection of work that I previously worked on and bring that into new things that I'm thinking about today. Cause I guess everything is kind of an extension of of the thing before it. I not I don't have these clear de demarcated lines of kind of new projects. Everything is kind of I guess mixed in. The lines are blurred. I'm curious about the process of kind of constructing each of these um, narratives. Um, if that's all mythologies, if that's what you want to call them. I don't know. I don't know. I'm just adding, giving you words. <laughs> um, what did that look like? <laughs> what did that look like for you? And especially in terms of audio, right? 
Yeah. So when you say like construct, constructing these stories or, you know, whatever self mythologies, do you mean like the, the kind of logistics of making it? Like, what do you mean by that when you say um, the construction, like interested in the process? I guess I'm interested in how you kind of got into got in, not into the mindset of them, but they're these very sort of personal narratives from the point of view of each of these creatures, right? Or each of these organisms, each of these life forms. So I guess I'm quite curious in just the process of how you went about sort of, um, mm -hmm. I guess, immersing yourself in each of those life forms sort of being. Yeah, well, you them. know, sure, sure. I mean, obviously, obviously, obviously as if everyone is obviously thinking what I'm thinking but to me it was obvious that I would be anthropomorphizing these creatures because this is this is what humans tend to do you know unless you're like you know really kind of like strident scientist who knows you know better um but I guess I was just thinking about things that were happening in and around me around us that felt very urgent and important um not just now but maybe especially now so for example the seagull I was thinking about the air, you know, thinking about the air that we're breathing, thinking about how that relates to coronavirus. Um, I, you know, I, I wrote this, you know, a few months ago, so it was kind of in the the height of all the frenzy of being really unsure about these airborne particles and how they might transmit. So, you know, and then thinking also largely about pollution, you know, chemical pollution. Um, things that we breathe. So, you know, thinking about how would a seagull think about this? in their own perspective, but I guess through the lens of, of course, a human or myself. But yeah, trying to, I guess, imagine what, 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 what madness the world must look like to all these animals who are just living their lives and, and so much in the present and have to contend with so much garbage that um, we're emitting. So, I mean, those are the things I was thinking about. I was deeply thinking about, thinking about a lot of things that I'm concerned about, water pollution, noise pollution, you know, from the perspective of, let's say, the orca, and thinking about other things like garbage, thinking about kind of our total disregard and I guess lack of respect for the land, not everyone, but, you know, corporate interests, resource extraction, capitalism, that type of thing. And so I guess it's all these big world topics and how do you shrink them down and make them easily digestible? Because I oftentimes get very, very overwhelmed and I can retreat into a very kind of isolated, nihilistic frame of mind. And it's almost unbearable to really think about all the challenges we have, but it's obviously really futile to think like that. So, I mean, whilst I was thinking about a lot of these things, I was reading, you know, just like, just stuff in the news. And it was, it, it, yeah, it got me down, but you know, I think it's important to be aware as well, right? There are certain things that are happening specifically on the Pacific Northwest coast with regard to pipelines that are being built um, at the opposition of many people, um, indigenous or uh, colonial settler um, descendants or otherwise you know, but these things have capital interests. So they just keep going and they, you know, um, there is this, a spider web work of destruction that these things cause. But anyways, so yeah, I had to get into that frame of mind. I had to kind of educate myself, um, even if it was just very general information that I could, you know, find on the news as a way to kind of speak about larger endemic systemic problems that we're seeing in lots of different countries that, you know, I might not have direct relationship to, but I can see, I, I, I hear about. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I mean, yeah, I guess it's just having time to think, yeah. having time to really, really get down and think about these things and think about like how you can insert these ideas into your work. Because I think, I think it's impossible mm -hmm. that people wouldn't be affected um, creatively, even if you were not addressing these things head on, how can you not? We've all been at home thinking about these issues. So, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm gonna uh, ask you more about what you think the kind of power of sound, in a sense, is a little bit later. But I just want to touch on the specifics. So, if we get more into the, I guess, the process for you, what was it about? What was the process of working with sound like for you for this commission? Because you have before in your practice, but not in this scale. You know, not for this sort of digital environment. Mm. What was that like? 
Well, I think like some of the processes in which I was um, responsible for, let's just say like kind of creating the arrangement, like digging up different sounds and slicing them up together, working with um, an amazing voice actor, uh, Samantha Lawson. Um, you know, that kind of was all the same with the exception of obviously working with Samantha, which was difficult because it was kind of the height of COVID and she is based um, in another country. So, you know, you don't have that direct relationship with being some with someone in the studio and providing direction and, and, you know, encouragement or notes or something. So that was tricky. But I mean, with regards to working um, with Tom, Tom Slater from uh, Call and Response at Somerset House, I really had to let go of my control issues. And I think it would have been okay if I kind of was there, you know, all the time, like overseeing and like micromanaging, but I thought it was actually really exciting just to kind of like, you know, talk through ideas, listen to a bunch of sounds and also get, you know, his input into things. And that was really exciting and important for me because I've never worked um, with, uh, with a 360 spatial sound, you know, so I'm a very, very DIY basic, basic uh, sound person, right? So being exposed to that type of technology is very exciting because you are open to possibilities that you would not even know were um, available to you because of the kind of, yeah, just the lack of knowledge that one is able to do that with certain machines and gadgets and stuff. So that was actually very exciting. I mean, that, that's probably the hope that any time you do something, you're able to learn and I mean this is why I really enjoy collaboration because once you work with someone and you have to let go which is difficult for someone like me who's you know I I, I have control tendencies it's uh it, it's exciting because you become vulnerable so you need to let go and then new things happen which are unexpected you know good and bad but you grow from those things so I really enjoyed it that was great definitely mm -hmm. I mean I think we all we all have we all have control issues, don't worry. We all do. Um, I was, I was, I felt like I was very kind of walking around and wanted to. I mean, it's an immersive environment, but I was very. I really felt like I wanted. I was like walking around with my headphones on, listening to it. You know, before I had a little sneak preview of the sound, everyone. Um, but it really did kind of key me into this ability. I, you know, I wanted to explore. I wanted to explore the space. I wanted to explore the space with the sound, um, and I feel like like Adrian Marie Brown talks about um, seeing this idea of wholeness as healing behavior. Do you think there's a kind of a certain way of listening or a different way of experiencing or working with sound that came to you through this project? Well, I think, you know, especially for something like this where it's completely um, audio dependent, which in many ways is really problematic because obviously there are folks who are hearing impaired or who are deaf who are not able to experience that. So that would be something that I would think about um, that's not positive. But um, with regards to the way I usually work with this, with a depending, dependent on a lot of visuals, costumes, people, you know, film, painting, sculpture, uh, those are things you can rest and lean upon, right? But when you have just the sound component or similarly, if you were to make a film with no sound, right? You really need to think about how that's going to be, I guess, absorbed by your audience. And so I guess the way I thought about it was, I, it is a long piece, I do admit that, but I, I'm very concerned with not boring people. And that's probably why I wrote something that was a bit more linear that one would hopefully want to follow along to. I think sometimes when I work in a gallery space, I don't mind if things are a bit more nonlinear and abstract and people are able to walk in and out. And I also do that because I never want people to feel bound to a space in order to kind of experience the whole work. Um, but I guess for this, I think, you know, hearing you tomorrow say that you were walking around your garden, you know, I don't know what you're doing, your chores, meditating, hanging out, that's really exciting for me because that's the way I like to experience those things. When, when my dog was alive, I, you know, that's how I experienced a lot of different sound works. I would take him for a walk, be in nature and kind of really allow myself to be present and listen to things very deeply because this is something that I, um, I don't always do. And so I think it's important. And um, I think you pointed out to me earlier that 
the work has a lot of, uh, there's some repetitive refrains or words and one of them is listen, you know, and that idea is that I don't always listen to, I'm always running constantly on this kind of grinding, you know, machinery. And I'm also just kind of like zipping by and I'm never in the moment. This is something that I need to work on. And so I think that my hope is that, yeah, the, yeah, I guess I just want people to feel relaxed. If you want to listen to this before you go to bed, that's cool too, you know? I don't know if that does, answers your question. I mean, it does, it does very much feel like this kind of, um, almost like a guided meditation or like a, that's how I, you know, I kept listening to the different parts and then listening and re-listening and re-listening. But there is this really kind of um, undeniable feeling of some sense of healing or some sense of um, roundness in the whole work. Um, and I wanted to draw attention to, there's a quote um, by a writer, a black feminist writer called Tony Cady Bambara, um, who says, the role of the writer is to make the revolution irresistible, which in many ways ties into this notion of visionary fiction. So I was wondering what you thought of the idea of auditory fiction um, and sound as a connected medium or medium of possibilities. Well, I think on one hand, you know, as someone who... Um, who's like a hearing person, you know, that functions in a way where you can have direct messages, you can use sound as a material, think of it as certain, I guess, a material of building blocks in order to kind of transmit, you know, whatever, whatever ideas that you're thinking. Of course, on the other hand, if, we, if, if I think about that from the perspective of the hearing person, I feel like there's definitely obviously huge blind spots. So, I mean, what I will say is directly speaking to your quote, and thinking about, um, you know, this actual work as auditory fiction and, you know, how there might be an urgency from the maker to make certain ideas irresistible. That is really kind of the framework in which I thought about these ideas. So, for example, how can we think about, you know, systemic large world, you know, <laughs> emotionally crushing topics but in a way where they kind of are bite-sized where we're able to digest them because these are things that should be of interest and urgency to everyone right really I mean I don't always believe in I don't believe in universality because it's impossible but they, you know some you know these things are important for everyone to think about and so I really love that quote because it's true it's like I feel as an artist that's what it is it's like you spoke about intention before it's like the responsibility that I choose to try to take on right i'm not saying everyone needs that people can are free to do what they want but just for me the way my work functions naturally the way i enjoy working as an artist with other people um yeah it's important to get some of these messages out again especially in places like public institutions when there's a whole host of um, folks that are coming through that you know don't always belong to an art world demographic you know I get a lot of kids that come to my shows too just because of the nature of kind of I guess the the objects or things that are involved in some of the installations and it's really important to get people thinking um, yeah so I um, I like the idea of auditory fiction <laughs> again I don't know if that answers your question I think I was being a little bit about it but oh it's more of a conversation isn't it really yeah Let's see where we get to yeah um as a reminder just reminding people that we um we are we have got a q a if anyone wants to add any questions in um just add them in the comment section in the social media that you're watching on or on the website that you're watching on and um, we will make sure that they get asked and um, if i don't see any coming in we will continue going for a little longer and then we will do a little wrap up so my next question while we wait for those to come in is just, um, we were, one of my favorite um, voices in the piece is the cabbage who says, <laughs> he says, you nurtured and willed me into existence. Um, and throughout the whole piece, you know, I've been talking about different issues that each of these, um, each of these voices raise, um, but there's a fragility to all of it, to the whole auditory experience. It's kind of very sort of trance-like but there's also this really clear idea of interdependence, like you're talking about the importance of collaboration um, and survival, interdependence for survival, sorry, is, is very clear here. There's, there's a way that a lot of the different um, voices you'll hear, parts that they say echoed in the next part, for example. Um, and I'm just quite curious about this kind of leakage between, between the voices. You could talk on that a little bit. So when you say leakage, do you mean like certain repetitive refrains that are repeated throughout yeah. each character's story? Yeah, I guess because I was also exactly. really, 
So if we go back to the idea of the shapeshifter or kind of like the, I guess the main protagonist in a lot of work is this kind of like, I guess, femme or female um, archetype, which is kind of dressed up as a shaman who is a shapeshifter. Um, I was thinking about, you know, there are five different characters, but I, are they also one character that's kind of floating through the bodies of many different animals in order to take different forms, in order to take the audience on a journey through like the sky, land, water, forest, etc. So the reason why there is some repetition is also because of the idea of interconnectedness and how everything affects, you know, from the, the, the minute to the most, the, the most grand, the, to the largest thing, it's like everything is connected. So whatever would concern, let's say, you know, the bird would also be of concern to the plant or to be concerned to the insect because all of these things are, in, you know, we're all, we're all connected. Like, I know this, that sounds like a very corny notion, but I mean, if you really deeply think about it, it I mean, it's very, very true. And so I also wanted to kind of have, I guess, kind of what's that word called? You know, when there's like a song, it's like an earworm, is that what it's called? When you get, can't get a song out of your yeah, head. So I, yeah, wanted yeah. To, yeah, yeah. I wanted to kind of create that thing where you really are listening. And when I, you know, it's, there's that part in the, in the cabbages kind of um, narration where they talk about, you know, plants also communicate, which I think many people already obviously know. People obviously sometimes communicate to their plants and we talk to their plants. But the idea that, you know, we cannot um, centralize the way in which humans operate on this and interface with the world and lay that out onto every other being and creature here, right? So it's just because we can't hear or understand the way certain creatures or plants will speak. It doesn't mean that they don't have language. You know, this is the thing. So um, it's the idea that you are listening. And how do you how do you listen to a rock? How do you listen to a river? How do you listen to a forest? You know, there are ways in which you can do that, that again, it shouldn't only be so hearing dependent as where I was talking about how, you know, there is the problematics of it coming being solely for, you know, an auditory experience and how that obviously there's a huge blind spot or it, it doesn't include um, uh, a whole swath of folks who aren't able to participate. So what are other ways in which we can hear, right? Like, I guess hearing is doesn't necessarily, listening doesn't necessarily only mean this way. But yeah, I guess another thing, if we go back to my interest in dreaming, right? The dangerous daydreamer, I think that's called, it, you know, the idea that we would even dare to dream up new worlds, dream up new possibilities for one another, for, for our community, you know, for the planet. You know, that idea of dreams and how dreams are like these I kind of like, I don't know, I, I don't even know how to explain sometimes the feelings that I have when I wake up from dreams. You know, these uncanny feelings of slipperiness, how things slide in and out of one another. I guess that was kind of the thing I was trying to, I don't know, allude to the idea of kind of like repetition. Yeah. And I guess what you just said, the idea of like uh, the trance, you know, which relates to kind of, again, shamanism, how one is able to get to that altered state frame of mind in order to kind of transcend this this plane and get to another one i guess this is how people who do transcendental meditation must also feel but anyways yeah it's definitely um i think this idea that there's something about sound that makes the idea of possibility feel even more possible there's something about the realm of sound that that really brings this idea of possibilities into the into the frame or into the into the fore, I guess. Um, that does it in such a way that is maybe um, vibration, you know, it is vibrational, but is something more than you don't need to necessarily know the words, know the the images, but there's something about the 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 vibration, something about the the space of sound that makes that kind of is that space of possibility, I guess. Mm. So as we are just getting to the end of the um, conversation, um, just a reminder if anyone does want to ask any questions, you know, it's not too late, we've got about five minutes or so, but we'll, I'll start wrapping up if, if I don't see any come in um, over the next few minutes. Um, thank, I just want to say thank you to Zadie um, while I think of any more questions for this conversation already. It's already been a pleasure. Thank you for everyone for sticking with us through the glitch um, and the rain. Um, you know what's no one, no one ever has questions after I do a talk because I like <laughs> ramble you talk. on and on and on. Yeah, because I talk a lot. I think that's my strategy. So I'm just like, I've covered all the pieces. 
But also because like I've been rambling a bit because it's like I don't know if there's like a, a delay between you and I. So then it's like instead of having a silent period, I'm just like, I'm just going to talk on top of this gap. But I'm probably on your side. You're probably like, man, you got to stop talking so I can get a word. In. But that's what's happening. No, it's been great. But I'm also wondering if you have anything that, because I think there's always this thing that um, I always want to ask guys if people don't ask them about something that they really want to talk about, but it's never, they never get asked that question or if there's anything, any kind of other comments you want to add you don't feel like we've really touched on? Um, I any mean, kind of parting comments? You know, I, I really do, I, I, the, you know, the conversation that me and you had with kind of the things that you were asking me, I feel like you had really, really good questions. I feel like, if you have any a last comment or a quote or a question, if there was a favorite thing, a favorite, that's so narcissistic. If there was something in the sound work that popped out to you that was interesting or something that stuck with you, um, what was I actually, it? My favorite line actually in the piece was this line that says, um, all, vo all bodies that vibrate change are seen as a threat. We've just had a question come through from the audience, but um, I just thought that was a really beautiful poetic line. Okay, so our question is, um, how this work with spatial sounds might impact how you approach sound with other projects? Well, that's Thank a very you. good question. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, before I even got hooked up with Somerset House, as I was saying, I was working on an exhibition that's going to um, open in Canada at the end of October. And I had never worked with spatial sound, but it's something I really, really wanted to do. And so when I was able to do this residency and work with Tom, I was so excited because I just thought this is the person that I was trying to think, like, who is this person I need to work with in order to make this happen? So basically, um, this sound work is going to premiere, obviously, to Tonight, and it's an audio, you know, full body, a full work that you can experience online or just, you know, headphones, whatever. But it actually will be part of a larger um, installation exhibition that um, has like um, a variety of, of kind of large kind of costume garments and different sculptures that um, my collaborative partner Benito made, which are amazing. And so the way I have thought specifically about that piece in that in that space is how I'm able to work with live performance without having live people embody the work, right? Not only because of COVID, this is something I was thinking about before, how are you able to create that type of live theatricality without having people activate it? And for me, within that space, it's the idea that, that there will be certain speakers set up and the, the audio will move around the space in a way where hopefully the audience feels like there is actually, you know, mm, characters or avatars or, or uh, uh, creatures present in the room with them. And so the sound will basically, um, the sound will be um, timed and organized with theatrical lighting and the sculptures that are there. So it's the thought that the sculptures look like they're talking, the voices and the sounds are emanating from these kind of like sculptural objects. So I guess it's just storytelling in a physical way where you know, you're know you in an, an immersive environment. But the thing that's really cool about this piece with um, that I did with Tom is that uh, you know hopefully you're able to get that experience on your headphones when you're walking around town or at your, I don't know, in your garden, hanging out on the couch, eating ice cream, in your studio, I don't know, anyways. The, the second question we've got coming in, um, but I think you kind of kind of half answered it, but maybe not, is what you're working on next. I'm assuming it's, it's the exhibitions, but tell me if not. Yeah, well, I, um, I'm working on a few things next. So uh, I am working with my um, permanent longtime collaborator, Benito, um, obviously on the exhibition that's opening up in Canada and that'll open up in Leeds next year. And we're working on a small kind of um, experimental performance, live performance with um, another long-term collaborator of mine, Jaya U. Korti. And then I've got, um, I'm really excited about just presenting some work alongside an artist I really admire and a friend of mine named Admin Oliti, and that will be with um, uh, Galeria Agustina Ferreira in um, Curimanzutu in Mexico. And just some other stuff next year that I'm really excited about. So yeah, and in, and in London next year too. So that will be cool because I don't often do things here. So it'll be nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Exciting. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to wrap up the conversation just because uh, in 10 minutes you'll all be able to watch uh, Zadie's new work um, on assembly2020.co. So make sure that you uh, log into that if you and, and wait until 7 p.m. or go and get a drink, come back, log in and watch and listen. Um, and we, oh yeah, I just wanted to wrap it up by saying thank you so much, Zadie. It's been really exciting, really uh, enriching to talk to you at length. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tamar, and you're such a Thank trooper. You. You're so professional. You just plowed through all the technical difficulties. <laughs> and it's very important for me to say this here because I feel like that got us off a little bit to a rockier start than we had expected. Mm -hmm. I really want to um, really hold space and say thank you so much for being so thorough in your questions and your thoughts about the work and the way in which you engaged and held space for me. I'm really, really thankful for that. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. I feel like this, This um, thank you also for the invitation to reread Emergent Strategy. It's been a lot of, um, you know, yeah. I've got some more lessons from that as well. Everyone must be get that. We are fine. Everyone has to. Everyone has to. Thank it you was also for the studio yeah. team. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it was recommended to me by Legacy Russell, who is an amazing artist and writer and just uh, dropped a book, Glitch Feminism, mm -hmm. which everyone should also get. So really important kind of critical thinkers that are, you know, wonderfully making things that are easily accessible to all of us. So, yeah. Absolutely. Is it a bit cheesy if I finish with reading the core principles of emergent strategy? As no, you should, you should Let's absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. And then yeah, everyone yeah. can log out from us. Okay. Core, okay. core principles. Change is constant. Be like water. There is always enough time for the right work. There is a conversation in the room that only these people at this moment can have. Find it. Never a failure, always a lesson. Trust the people. If you trust the people, they become trustworthy. Move at the speed of trust. Focus on critical connections more than critical mass. Build the resilience by building the relationships. Less prep, more presence. What you pay attention to grows. And with that, we leave you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you.